Hi, I'm Ashley Ford, and this is 112BK. Coming up, for women, there's a lot to be angry about. Rebecca Traster discusses turning anger into political power in her new book, Good and Mad. This is a view of full women as fully human. Right. These young women are willing to be up on these stages and say, I'm furious, I'm scared, I have the whole range of human emotions, and I am right. here because this fight is crucial. Welcome to the show. On your emotional register, how often do you reach anger, even rage? Now me, ah, multiple times a day, depending on how much of the news I'm reading. Our next guest wants you to know that women's anger is not only potent, but essential for social change. And it has been throughout history. She writes about it in her new book, Good and Mad, The Revolutionary Power of Women's Anger. And I'm so happy it brings her on the show today. Rebecca Traster, welcome to 112 BK. I'm so happy to be here, Ashley. Thanks for so having me. So happy to have you. So, you know, over the past couple of years, the list of things that women could be angry about is just, it seems to be growing exponentially. Yes. Um, not that there haven't always been things there. Mm -hmm. But there's this saying, right? that I, people always wanna throw in your face, which is essentially, don't get mad, mm. get even. Mm -hmm. But this book seems to posit that getting mad is part of getting even. Yeah, you can't, I mean, that that's part of the thing that we don't like to think about, is mm -hmm. that if you're not enraged, and here I'm talking about a specifically politically progressive anger, and we right. can talk also about women's anger on a more reactionary, more conservative white patriarchal side, but when mm -hmm. we talk about what, Part of what my book is arguing is that the transformative progressive social movements in this country's history, from mm -hmm. abolition and suffrage through the labor movement, the civil rights movement, the women's movement of the 1970s, the gay rights movement of the 20th mm -hmm. century, those movements were catalyzed by anger. You have to be angry at what's wrong with the world in order to start being willing to give your time, your energy, your life to making things better mm -hmm. in the world. And I think that we gloss over that or look away from it because we have been taught that the anger of marginalized people, including women, mm -hmm. um, is unattractive, disruptive, right. threatening, all these ugly things. And we don't want to look at it and consider it as politically consequential, but in fact, right. It has been politically consequential. And what's interesting to me about it is that you also sort of put up that, like, women are clearly not the only ones who reap the benefits of women's anger. No. Women's, women's anger is a galvanizing force for everybody. And women's anger has not just been about gendered inequality. That's, right. uh, I mean, of course, so many forms of bias inequality, so many of the power hierarchies, economic, social, sexual, political, mm -hmm. um, are combined, right, inequities. Right. But there's this sense that if women are angry, it's just about some particularly gendered issue. Mm -hmm. Women's anger about racist violence, racial inequality, mm -hmm. is fundamental to the to the explosion and propulsion of a civil rights movement. Look at Rosa Parks and Mamie Till. Mm. Yes. Um, you know, women who catalyzed a civil rights movement. Now, we've not ever been asked to think of them as angry women. In fact, quite right. the opposite. We're taught that right. Mamie Till, who had an open casket funeral for her 14-year-old son Emmett after he was brutally killed mm -hmm. um, for after being falsely accused of making a pass at a white woman, she insisted that America look at the the pictures, the images right. of of his brutally beaten dead body, yes. both via an open casket funeral, and those images were published in Jet Magazine. Rosa Parks, of course, the same year, 1955, refused to give up her seat on a bus in Montgomery, right. um, which became the catalyst for the Montgomery bus boycott. Mm -hmm. We were taught about both of those women as stoic, demure, Rosa Parks, exhausted, right. um, an exhausted seamstress. She was a deeply political person who right. worked for the NAACP as an investigator investigating the gang rapes of black women by white men in the Jim yeah. Crow South. We were never taught about her as anger, but in, as angry. But in fact, Rosa Parks's fury at racism and, and racial inequality motivated her lifetime of work to battle it. Yeah. So, um, but and that's not. I mean, it, she she was deeply engaged in issues of gendered inequality too. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's not just about women's issues that women's anger. Women were crucial to the labor movement about right. unjust labor practices, uh, low wages. They still are. You can see there are hotel workers on strike in this country mm -hmm. right now. There are fast food workers on strike. Uh, many of them, women. One of the things I remember you um, stating that really it blew my mind mm -hmm. because I didn't know it was the case was that women couldn't get credit cards in their own name until the mid-1970s? Yes, the, the passage, there was the passage in the mid-1970s. Right. Another thing that's mind-blowing, the use of birth control was illegal until the Supreme Court made it legal in two separate decisions. The first was that it was legal for married people to use birth control, mm. and that was in the late 60s. i got to remember the year. And then the second one uh, was that it was legal for single people, and that was in the early 1970s. Yeah. So these, a lot of these victories that—so I was born in 1975, and mm -hmm. I was born in an era in which I think that— it's not that my, my parents were political people. Right. They they raised me to think about these issues, but so much of the pop culture and the political uh, rhetoric around me told me that mm -hmm. these victories had been won. We were past them. There was nothing to be angry right. about anymore. And I think that we, if you were born um, and came to consciousness after that period where these immense hurdles had been crossed, you could mm -hmm. kind of take it for granted that you could get a credit card in your own name. Yes. But in fact, for my mother's generation, no, that mm -hmm. was not true. Wow. That's just one of those things, one of the many things that lets me know quite often, and what I like about the book is that it gives us this view of a history that I'm realizing more and more we haven't had any real access to, or maybe that we've had access to, but it's never been put out the way it's put down in the book. Well, and in part, we're not given access to that history because they don't want us to be angry about this. They right. want they want people, you know, uh, the idea of people still being angry and still wanting to have these fights and, and mm -hmm. getting closer to more victories is very threatening to the way the power structure works. Right. And so there's an incentive to sort of keep people from this history or from an idea of how precarious these wins were, right? right. The Voting Rights Act passed yes. in 1965. It was gutted by the Supreme Court a few mm -hmm. years ago. And it, in fact, enabled the electoral results in some of the cases uh, in the midterms of 2018 mm -hmm. in which uh, voter suppression and purging of the rolls um, enabled Republican candidates to beat Democratic candidates. Right. Um, you know, these battles are ongoing, and we like to tell ourselves a very uh, pernicious lie in the United States over and over again that we've fixed whatever inequities hobbled us at our start. Yes. But in fact, yes. the reason that we're told that lie is because we want people to stop being angry about right. inequity um, and stop fighting for more. Yes. Who? Now that's a real one. Mm -hmm. Then not wanting people to be angry so they don't fight for more. It's like the jobs who don't want you to know what everybody else is making because yeah. they don't want you guys right. talking about it. They want to anesthetize us against right. fury because fury is politically consequential and powerful. Right. In this la in these last midterms, mm -hmm. what were some examples you saw of women's anger sort of bringing <laughs> things to fruition? Because I feel like I saw it everywhere. It was. It was <gasps> everywhere. So. Anger is what drove a whole lot of women off of their couches, out their doors to become candidates for the first time. Right. This historic number of women, many of them women of color, mm -hmm. winning in flipping districts in the House, um, winning historic numbers of House seats in gubernatorial elections. Mm -hmm. A lot of those women were first-time candidates. Right. Um, a lot of them became candidates because they were so angry in the wake of the 2016 election. Right. But part of the way that they won both their primaries and then the general election that we mm -hmm. just saw, um, is that they had armies of pissed off women <laughs> working on their behalf, knocking right. doors, registering voters, doing the organizing. You've seen the entrance of millions of formerly apathetic women mm -hmm. um, into organizing structures, new groups that are you know, diverting funds in creative new ways, that yes. are trying to draw new people into the electorate, that are fighting voter suppression, that are working to train and support new kinds of candidates, especially mm -hmm women of color, women, uh, candidates of color, young candidates, progressive candidates to remake a Democratic Party sort of from the right. ground up. And we saw and a huge amount of that activism is driven by by angry women. Right. All the time. All the time. Here we go. Now, to keep this momentum mm -hmm. that I feel like we have really come up mm -hmm. with in the past couple of years, mm -hmm. to keep it going, I, I think a lot about the next generation, mm. the people coming up under us, and specifically the young women coming up mm -hmm. under us. And I gotta tell you, when I look at the young women 
who are coming up behind us, I'm like, oh, this isn't something that we'll have to worry about. I feel the same is way. them being angry when I think about an Emma Gonzalez? That's exactly what I was going to say. The, the the March for Our Lives last spring right. was one of it was a remarkable moment for me because I have lived as a feminist journalist. I've been asked for years, why aren't young women angry? Why aren't young women engaged? And first of all. It's always been true that they have been. I've always sort of responded right. like you're just not look it's it's taken a different form. It's right. growing, it's changing with technology, but you know, young women sort of brought feminist conversation back into mainstream media. They've been mm -hmm. doing work around reproductive justice movements, around, you know, all kinds of creative new forms of activism. They're the ones who've been powering in many cases fight for 15 movements, paid leave movements, right. all the policy stuff. So it hasn't been true that young women haven't been angry, but there is this explosion of a kind of um a more widely heard fury now, mm -hmm. electorally with the hashtag Me Too movement, which of course comes out of Tarana Burke's 2006 Me Too movement. Um, there is, we're in a moment in which that rage is undeniable and you can't pretend not to hear it. Right. In part, some of that rage is directed at an older generation, including mm -hmm. an older generation of progressive activists and, and feminists, which makes it right. all very uncomfortable. But when I saw that March for Our Lives mm -hmm. last spring, I thought, oh, <laughs> I see the future and it's so good. Yes. <laughs> that that was an example of a a generation it's really it's younger than millennials whatever I don't yes. know I'm sure there's a Their name generation for the, Z. Right. That generation mm -hmm. generation Z <laughs> that has it was one of the most flawlessly inclusive mm -hmm. marches I've ever seen. The young people there we're making connections between gun violence and a need for better gun control and standing up against the NRA. They were connecting that to criminal justice reform, to police violence, to, mm -hmm. to racist arrest practices, yes. to misogyny, to white patriarchal power. You had people up in that march that was officially supposed to be about guns, talking about, I'm here fighting for women. Mm -hmm. your, you know, your, your guns have more rights than my vagina, right? Like right. I saw those signs, I saw that rhetoric, I saw a, a diverse group of leaders, mm -hmm. I saw young women who were behaving in public ways, rhetorically and oratorically, in ways that women for generations have been discouraged from behaving. Yes. So you have Emma Gonzalez up there shouting, fighting. She doesn't, she's not made to look like women have been told they had to look at a no. certain point. She's willing to be herself. Uh, you had another woman up there who vomited on stage. Do you remember this? She was yes. nervous and she just turned and vomited. And you know what? She, then she started speaking. And I thought, yep. this is it. This is a view of full women as fully human. Right. These young women are willing to be up on these stages and say, I'm furious. I'm scared. I have the whole range of human emotions and I am right. here because this fight is crucial. And that was one of the most inspiring political events I've ever witnessed in my life. And it did suggest to me that not only are the kids okay, mm -hmm. they're going to help push us into the future and the next place that we have to go. That's amazing. And that's what we want. That's what we're that looking forward absolutely to. absolutely what we want. And in reading your book, one of the things that I just kept thinking was why haven't, why hasn't this book been written before? Like <laughs> why hasn't somebody done this before. How did you even get to a place where you went, that's the book I want to write? These are the essays that I want to write. Well, it's interesting because I don't know why I never thought of this before. And, and, and we should say that there right. are other, there are a couple other books that were published yes. within the same year. Eloquent Rage. Eloquent Rage by Brittany Cooper, yes. which is one of my guiding lights as a mm -hmm. book. It's a, it's about discovering her black feminist anger and using it as a superpower. Right. Soraya Chamali's book, Rage Becomes Her, was published a couple yes. of weeks before mine. It's excellent. And it, mm -hmm. mine is about anger and a political context and hers deals with some of that too but it's also about the individual sort of psychological messages that women are sent mm. um, which compel them to keep their anger under wraps to hide right. it to disguise it as something else of course Audre Lorde was writing about this in the early 1980s yes. um, her essay The Uses of Anger um, Sister Outsider this is mm -hmm. Audre Lorde was writing about anger so there have been feminist conversations about anger that Absolutely. extend back but in terms of sort of putting it all together I think that I can only answer Mm -hmm. With regard to me, it's because I've absorbed the same messages that everybody else has. So right. I, I, as a feminist journalist who's been angry not only about gendered inequality, but racial inequality, economic inequality for my whole life, of mm -hmm. course anger undergirded my work. But I would have never looked at it and thought of it as the force that shaped my work. I, right. I probably was encouraged to not think about it. And I certainly I write yes. in the book about how I work to cover it up, to make mm -hmm. myself funny and sweet and non-confrontational and hilarious and ironic, even in my furious feminism as a writer. Right. Um, even in the wake of the 2016 election, and mm -hmm. I, by this time I'd written about anger. I had, I had 
reported on anger. I, I was a 40 something year old woman, mm -hmm. um, 41 year, years old um, in, the, in 2016. I could talk more confidently about my own anger, and yet I right. didn't see it as formative and catalytic. Right. And in fact, in the conversation I had where the, this book, the idea for this book um, sort of derived, I was talking to my husband and I said, I want to figure out what my work is moving forward, mm -hmm. but I can't think straight because I'm so angry. I still saw anger as an obs uh, obstructive force, mm. not as a clarifying one. And it was my husband who said, well, maybe you should write about anger. And as soon as he made the suggestion, it was like light went on. And I was like, oh my God. And then I did see it, the anger itself, as the thread Mm -hmm. linking so much of the history that I had been writing about as a journalist trying to tell a story about gender and race and right. possibility in America over centuries, linking past and our present political situation and what might take us into the future, mm -hmm. suddenly anger, instead of being this fuzzy force, became an organizing one. And I was a like, right, this point. is the thread I need to draw out. Right. But it, was, it took a long time to be able to embrace it as as a frame right. and not try to shy away from it as something that was going to undermine <laughs> my own argument. Right, and it, that's hard because we get told that emotions right. always, always uh, that emotions make your argument invalid. The minute you start feeling about mm -hmm. them, you're not focused, and, you're not clear, you're not thinking straight. And women are told that, women of color are told that in very is, extra specific ways, right. in part because we are presumed to be irrational, whereas mm. men, especially white men, are presumed as our normative citizens to mm. be rational thinkers. And so when they right. deploy anger on their own behalf, right. it only, it doesn't disqualify them as rational because we, we they're presumptively reasoned thinkers to begin with. Now so this, it only undergirds it. This makes me think about the fact that your book came out, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> <laughs> right as um, Brett Kavanaugh, Brett Kavanaugh <laughs> was being um, confirmed, yes, essentially, mm -hmm. and that was the narrative for mm -hmm. you know his supporters was that he was reliable and she was not, and so he could use anger. It wasn't that you know we we there's been a lot of conversation about how she couldn't have been angry. Christine Blasey Ford right. in her testimony, if she had raised her voice, mm -hmm. shouted back, "I like beer." I mean, we can't even imagine. We can't imagine a right. A, a mirror react, a mirror display. Mm -hmm. um, she would have been immediately disqualified as yes. hysterical, over emotional. She couldn't have been clear in her memories. All the ways she was disqualified anyway, presumed right. to be not rational. Uh, I think Orrin Hatch said a little mixed up, which is yeah. just an update on a little bit slutty and a little bit nutty, which is what they used to say. Used to say about Anita yeah. Hill. So um, she was presumed to be a little mixed up from the mm -hmm. start, so not really a rational thinker. Whereas Brett Kavanaugh, despite, it's so funny, there's like nothing you could do. He could even literally yell, I like beer, and the presumption that maybe he drank too much and would have his own memories clouded didn't even seem to arise. There was such mm -hmm. a presumption of reason and authority in this powerful white man right. that when he got angry in that way that was wholly inappropriate for mm -hmm. the circumstance, and talking back to Amy Klobuchar, well, have you ever drunk till you blacked out? Until... You get to that point, um, you know. Even even when he's he's being clearly inappropriate given the setting, it's used to bolster his authority and mm -hmm. and you know the suggestion that he is angry. He's angry in a righteous way on his own behalf. It's hammering home how rational he is right. um, and his power. And he could. Use, it wasn't just that he was allowed to be angry and she wasn't. It's that mm -hmm. he could use it as as a weapon on his own behalf. Yes. And for her, had she used it, it would have hurt her. Right. Right. Can you really one of the things that I wanted to ask, um, because so much of this feels like it's happening just so rapidly. It is it's back yes. to back to mm -hmm. back to back. And it feels oppressive and it feels like it's all the time. So even sitting here talking about the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh, the first thing I think was, how long ago was that? <laughs> and then I remember that it was years. not yeah. that long ago. <laughs> no, it was it was six weeks ago. It was six yeah. weeks ago. So here's what I wonder about the sustaining force of mm -hmm. anger, right? Because I know the day that he got confirmed, the way I felt that day is not the way I feel mm -hmm. now. Like I'm still not okay with it. I'm still mad about mm -hmm. it, but it's not as strong. Mm -hmm. What these days is making you feel like, well, the, the existence of Brett Kavanaugh on the Supreme mm. Court makes me feel that's a kind of steady fury. And it's and oh, it's one sure. I felt for years about Clarence Thomas as uh -huh. well. The sort of the injustice oh, yeah. of it is so strong. And mm -hmm. and I suspect that there are gonna be rulings that enforce reinforce that 
that fury. I'm furious about Brian Kemp's suppression of the vote in Georgia. There's no mm. question to me that Stacey Abrams, who would have been the first black woman ever elected governor in this country, had more mm -hmm. support in her, in her gubernatorial bid than her opponent, Brian Kemp. But he right. was the secretary of state. He made voting extremely difficult, especially in black and brown communities. Mm -hmm. um, there were there were voting machines that didn't work. Uh, he held up a whole series of new registrants. It, mm -hmm. He did everything in his power, very Jim Crow style, to suppress that vote. And the result is he won by a hair. It is it is remarkable and historic that even given right. the level of suppression, Stacey Abrams got as close to technically winning as yes. she did. Um, I am livid with the fact that she will not serve as governor because it is very clear to me that her state wanted her to. Yes. Um, just as it is clear that uh, American voters, a majority of American voters, wanted Hillary Clinton to be the president. And yet right. Donald Trump is the president. One of the things that all of these instances and, and the fact that the senators who voted to confirm Brett Kavanaugh uh, were supported by millions more Americans, or right. millions fewer Americans than those who voted to keep him off the court. The majority of Americans did not believe Brett Kavanaugh and did not approve of Brett, Ka Brett Kavanaugh. Right. So one of the larger revelations, in, in addition to these instances of white-hot outrage on the day that something happens, mm -hmm. is the what's being exposed to us, which has long been true, but, we do, but which we don't like to think about in this mm -hmm. country, which is that we are in the grip of a minority rule. Right. And that's always been true when it comes to white patriarchy, mm -hmm. right? It was white men who yep. designed this country, who built its systems, its economy, its its government, its courts, its laws um, around themselves and their mm -hmm. own power. Um, in, they enslaved a population of African Americans, did not even consider African Americans fully human in the founding documents, mm -hmm. uh, did not enfranchise women, did not offer any legal rights or protections or possibility for economic stability to women. Mm -hmm. And in fact, on the labors of the enslaved populations and the unenfranchised domestic labor of women, they built this economy. Mm -hmm. And they built this country around their own power. And it, it has been a minority rule. And that, that has been chipped away at by mass movements over the course of centuries. Right. At the moment, our partisan politics are reflecting that that minority rule. Yep. Um, in part, not ironically, because Republican policies are on the side of continued white patriarchal dominance in mm -hmm. addition to grotesque economic inequality where so many of the resources are in the hands of the 1% at the top. Right. Um, but... The reality right now in a partisan frame is that Republicans are holding a huge amount of power at the top of the system, despite having the minority approval of the people who actually live in this country. And so these it's the structural reality that's being exposed by these daily things that enrage us in sort of super hot ways that are making us see the broader things that we have to be angry about. And the other thing is that anger isn't the only part of becoming civically engaged. No, and it, it may light the fire, mm -hmm. and it may always burn underneath your engagement, right. but we don't have to be that level of, of physically, viscerally livid every day that we go out and knock doors right. or, or work as activists or participate in strikes or tell the stories of uh, the real full stories of our lives, including mm -hmm. the parts about harassment or assault or whatever, yes. whatever entry we have into this conversation about the various kinds of inequality. Mm -hmm. Not every moment of that has to be exploding head on fire right. anger. But the anger that we feel might just be the fuel that gets us out there opening our mouths in whatever in, in whatever form of protest and participation we want to engage in. Whew. Good and mad. Good and mad. Rebecca Traster, thank you so much for thank talking you. with us Thank today. you for having me. I can't tell you how much I love talking. <laughs> That's our show for today. Tomorrow I'll be back for my final show, talking to the Innocence Project about a failure in our justice system that pushes individuals to accept guilty pleas even when they might be innocent. Hope to see you then.